There we go. Um, and this event is designed to complement our native plant fundraiser, which is currently um, live until the end of April. Um, and that's an opportunity to support our land-based youth programs here in Vancouver um, and receive a bundle of native plants for your backyard or balcony. Um, and I'll drop the link to the website in the chat. Um, and I will, yeah, I think we're ready to hand it over to Marika. Wonderful. Thank you, David. Um, my name is Marika. I am UIA's Stewardship Manager. And before we begin, I'd like to begin with raising my hands in gratitude to our host nations, the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh peoples. Uh, it's on their unceded traditional and ancestral lands where EYA's work is based. And I'm currently joining from Musqueam territory. And as I continue, I welcome others to type into the chat um, which territories they're joining us from. Now, EY's programs in plant nursery are based on uh, a land, the land traditionally known to the Squamish peoples as Squatch Eyes. And the meaning of Squatch Eyes is uh, the, I've heard a few different meanings. One of them is uh, that it's the underground tunnels of the two headed sea serpent. And another is where the place where the water comes up from the ground beneath. And these short stories were sh shared with us um, by Indigenous knowledge keepers, C. Swice, and um, our elders as well. And as a visitor and an uninvited guest on this land, I'm continually reflecting on what stewarding the land means to me. And at EYA, we're also really grateful as original stewards of the land, as of, are grateful to the original stewards of the land. Um, and we really strive to follow their leadership and, and, um, and be inspired by it in the work that we do at EYA. So with that, I'm honored to gather here with you all to learn together about how we can grow in relationship to the land and as stewards. And next up, um, I would love to introduce our amazing host for the evening, Kristen Muskelly. Uh, now, Kristen is never one to brag, so I'm gonna do my best to shine a light on the variety of gifts that she shares with the world. So over the past several years that I've known and known and learned from Kristen, um, I've come to know her as a very inspiring, very humble and a deeply generous human. Kristen's collaborated with EYA on a variety of projects over the past few years, including our native plant nursery, uh, the Strathcona wetland project, as well as our wildflower meadow projects across East Van. And in our native plant fundraisers and gifting events that David and I organize, we, we receive many questions for how we can best support native plants in our gardens and wild spaces. And when I don't know the answers to these questions, Satin Flower and the programs that Kristen leads have been an amazing resource for my own learning. So yeah, Kristen moves through life with a, a deep commitment to protecting and stewarding the diverse ecological communities across Coast Salish territories, and beyond. And through her many years working as a botanist and restoration ecologist, as the owner of Satin Flower Nurseries, as the co-leader of the Meadow Makers Program, and her many generous contributions to both academic and community-based education. Um, through all these different ways, Kristen has helped thousands of people learn how to grow native plants, support wildlife, and to heal the land. Um, so we are so excited to launch our fundraiser and to share the plants that our youth have learned from and cared from this season. And we're honored to have Kristen join us this evening to share the unique stories um, and, and needs of our precious plant allies. So thank you so much. And over to you, Kristen. 
Wow, thank you so much, Marika. <laughs> that was an extremely generous and nice welcoming and introduction. And I can't tell you how much I appreciate that. It means a lot to me. And it really means a lot to me to be here tonight. I think the world of the Environmental Youth Alliance and um, it just what an incredible initiative. And I hope people who are part of this talk tonight who might not know about Environmental Youth Alliance to check out the website and to reach out to me or directly to EYA for more information. And in gratitude for everyone who is part of Environmental Youth Alliance, uh, just amazing people. Tonight, um, I'm calling in from Chianu territory. I'm in Michosin. And these are shared territories with Songhees and Esquimalt nations, Lekwungen speaking peoples, as well as with Saanich nations. But with much gratitude to Chianu peoples, whose um, place where James, my husband, and myself live, and where we're going to be opening a second location to our nursery, which we're really excited about. And I'm going to start a screen share here and we'll get going. There's the be beautiful new um, Environmental Youth Alliance logo, and you'll see the new wonderful artwork on the website as well. You'll see that tonight's talk was called Native Plant Garden Design. And I also put growing because I ended up putting a whole bunch of propagation stuff by accident, <laughs> but it's all interrelated. So I think it'll be cohesive, but I had to make a little amendment there. We're gonna start with talking about the importance of native plants. Then I'm going to provide garden and growing examples tips for pollinator friendly gardens, soil watering placement slash density and approaches to gardening with native plants. And my last point there is covered and I can't remember what it is. <laughs> so I, I'm pretty sure it says something about garden applications or garden examples, that kind of thing. So our nursery, satin flower nurseries, um, is on the unceded Coast Salish territories of Wissanich peoples. And Wissanich nations include five different nations. There's Pauquichen, Sayot, Sartlip, Sakum, and also Malahat First Nation. And we partner with community on so many aspects of the nursery with um, Indigenous employment, uh, collaborations, partnership projects, a variety of initiatives and consultations throughout our programs and other aspects of the nursery and sharing about native plants, particularly any kind of sharing that's related to plant roles and uses that are connected to spirituality and well-being with community are shared carefully and with respect and in partnership. Um, our nursery is roughly divided into the three kind of components. One is is education and um, that ranges a whole bunch of things, of course, but Tonight's an example of that. We do longer term courses and we also do a variety of consultations, different kinds of consulting. And we have potted plants in a retail setting where anyone can come by through the week and purchase native plants or come look or ask questions. And then we also do seeds. And our goal is to inspire and empower people to connect with nature through native plants. And that's our, our driving force with the work that we do. And 
we are always encouraging people to celebrate um, the unique ecology of, of where you live and to honor that through learning about it and celebrating it. And native plants are a really tangible, wonderful connection to being able to help nature and honor the place where you may live. And remembering that we are all such an important part of conserving nature and we each play our part. And that um, can take on a variety of forms. So some of that is about respecting and conserving biological diversity. When we think about other animals that are connected to native plants other than humans, like birds and butterflies, insects, including bees, um, that native plants provide the best nutrition and other kinds of resources, like nesting habitat is an example. Also a deep consideration for um, indigenous peoples, uh, including food systems and culture, looking to plants as plant and wildlife relatives and respecting land stewardship, past and present. And um, this is an incredibly important part and an inherently important part of working with indigenous plant species. Plants, planting with native plants and integrating these into our home places, and especially in urban environments where many of us are living now, you can have a profound impact on increasing um, connectivity between habitat patches, which is really, really important for conserving biodiversity in urban environments and also teaching us about nature. And that's a lot of what we're gonna talk about tonight is the work that EYA has been doing with native plants and connecting people to plants so much can be learned through the growing of native plants and planting them where you are, are um, hands-on with them, where you see them every day. And whether that's on a in a community garden or a patio planter, or you lend your hand in volunteering to remove invasive species or whatever it might be, but we can all learn a whole lot from doing that. And of course, benefiting future generations beyond us and respecting our future generations. I was, um, Marika kindly shared the list of plants that EYA is working with. And I've taken a subset of those plants and we're gonna look at them and talk about them individually. And I selected ones where I thought broader concepts can be applied. Um, through the lessons that these plants teach us. So you'll, you'll see that as we go through. And we're going to start with some of the shrubs. And then we're also going to look at a grass species example. And we're also going to look at some of the wildflowers. So in the picture here, here's red flowering currant. It's a, a, an exquisite fuchsia colored shrub with these pendulous clusters of flowers that, um, well, can you think what uh, animal might be attracted to these tubular, tube-shaped red or pink flowers? Maybe um, just give that a thought for a moment. Um, but these are a hummingbird favorite. And that's often the case with tubular pink or red flowers. And that's a theme that you'll see. So in terms of relating that to garden design, one of the things to think about when you're first designing a garden space are your goals. And that can be, so, there's so much variety or variation in, in what people want out of their gardens and goals people might have. But sometimes it can be something like, you know, I want to make a really attractive garden for hummingbirds. And if that was the case for you, this would be a terrific shrub. So the other thing that I'm gleaning from this photograph, so this photograph is a new hedgerow planting that we have put in our new space in Machosan along a fence, but hedgerows can be um, 
So when I say hedger, I'm talking about relatively linear um, arrangements of woody plants that are um, often along a fence line or forming some kind of barrier or buffer between spaces. And these can be amazing places for wildlife, like birds, um, other insects. And in a garden setting, they can be terrific for managing water, providing some shade and structure, um, wonderful aesthetics. So if you imagine like behind this hedgerow is a, a chain link fence, but instead of that, we have this beautiful cluster of shrubs. And then for wildlife, having nesting opportunities, foraging opportunities, also flowering succession. So different flowering times in a garden, hedgerows are amazing. Growing red flowering currant, they have these blue clouded berries that might where my cursor is. And we grow them from seed, these beautiful shiny brown seeds. We also do them from cuttings. So that's a form of uh, propagation or growing native plants where you can take stem sections and they will form roots. And so there's all sorts of approachable and economical ways to increase numbers of plants. And that, that can help with um, accessibility for plants. And also if you just have a passion for them and really wanna do more of them, <laughs> you can hand them out to neighbors and friends and family and partners and all that kind of stuff. And here's baby little uh, red flowering currants from seed. Ocean spray is another uh, shrub. And this shrub, I think of as almost like a keystone species. Um, it's a in uh, our region, it's a common shrub and incredibly important for local wildlife and in particular butterflies. So it might not be the first thing you thought of maybe when you were thinking about butterflies, but if butterflies were one of your focal species in your garden design, then ocean spray would be a terrific choice for you to include. And these are all species where they lay their eggs on ocean spray and it's what their caterpillars eat. And with wildlife um, and butterflies are a perfect example of this, it's really important to think about the whole life history of, of different animals to really be able to support them. So we, as humans, sometimes make, um, you know, we notice things when they're at their showiest and value them when they're at their showiest, but really we should be paying attention to what these animals need over the whole course of their lives, including, so in the case of butterflies, when they're caterpillars um, is one of the phases uh, we need to pay attention to. So ocean spray, after it's done flowering, holds on to its seeds. And this becomes a wonderful forage opportunity for other animals. And I'm gonna be showing a number of examples to try to encourage you to appreciate plants even when they're not in full flower. And it's hard not to have that tendency because flowers are just glorious and incredibly important and beautiful, but plants also have a cycle and it's really important to value them during their entire life history. And when they have set seed or have gone into a different kind of part of their life cycle that they can be important for other animals. So here's a little bush tit. And it's an example of one of the birds that will come and glean little insects off of these old flowers through the winter. And you'll see other birds and animals in the little seed heads there. And lots of creatures nest in ocean spray as well. So roses are a plant that Marika said that folks are doing a lot of growing and are part of the, the plant projects with EYA. So there are three local roses. I'm just highlighting two here that EYA has been growing and gifting. One is Nootka Rose and one's Bald Hip Rose. And the one on the left, Nootka Rose, grows um, 
mostly sun and part shade, but bald hip rose really is a forest plant. And so I just wanted to compare the, excuse me, the photos there so you can start to see some of the differences. One of them is the hips and, and then the flowers are have uh, different qualities about them too. So Nootka Rose is a plant that we include in hedgerows quite often. The smell is just beautiful. They're extremely aromatic and very pollinator friendly. And, um, and then in the winter have these beautiful red rose hips and inside of the rose hips um, are the seeds and the and the fruit actually so the fruit isn't the red part it's the the akeen inside of there with the hairs on it and then I've, I've done a little cross section there where you can see the single seed inside the akeen of the rose and rose has tremendous qualities and such a variety of roles that um rose can be um be part of and Dominique um who had worked at the nursery uh I guess like about a year ago or so she had helped me with some of our experimenting with propagation of nutka rose and germination of nutka rose and we discovered during that time that it was the older rose hips that were germinating more freely and that we were struggling getting seedlings out of the red hips but instead taking the second year hips off that had gone through an entire winter or had stratified and we'll talk about cold stratification later but they were the ones to go on to have a higher germination rate and so these wonderful lessons from plants watching them outdoors and also working together to figure out the best growing approaches for plants you're just watching june plum or ozo berry start to um, it's been, it has been being pollinated and now the petals are falling off and it'll start to form fruit. One of the cool things and lessons from ozo berry or june plum is that it's a dioecious plant or in other words, the flowers are unisexual or just one sex and they're on different plants. And so people who are kind of like botany interested will recognize the little um, pistols in here with the stigma and style or the female parts on one flower. So that'd be on one plant. And then the stamens here with the anthers and filaments, the pollen producing or male parts of the flowers on a totally separate flower. So for a moment, just think about it, which, which would it be the female or the male that would have fruit? So it would be the female. So that's the ovary of the plant that turns into the fruit. So these little bowling pin shaped objects will ultimately become fruit if there if there's a pollen transfer. So not every ozo berry or June plum shrub you have will produce fruit, but um, if you have a mix of male and females, the females are sure to bear fruit. And there's a picture of them. So they're bright orange before they turn blue. And these really distinctive cotyledons. So that those are the first sprouts of them, and they have they're very broad and unlike the the leaf shape that ought autumn or uh, what am I trying to say? The leaf shape that ultimately um, comes about with June plum. So the last shrub before we move on to some of the wildflowers is salmon berry, and. The fruit is absolutely spectacular with a variety of shades and colors and uh, beautiful pink flowers. So thinking about hummingbirds again and early flying bees, um, big uh, female bumblebees are some of the pollinators that you see at this plant moving flower to flower. And here's an up close shot of the um interesting seeds and some fruit leather being made so eya um like i had mentioned has the plants that are being grown and distributed and this is the second subset of plants 
that we'll look at. And then we're going to be looking at some broader themes with uh, garden design and, and other aspects of pollinator friendly gardens and garden applications and examples. So Romer's fescue or Festuca romeri is one of the native bunch grasses that EYA is working with. And they um, grow in a distinctive bunch that has a blue color. Love when it flowers, these long stalks come up and you might not think of grass as flowering, but those are actual flowers. They're just highly modified, but they have all the basic components of other flowering plants and they are a flowering plant. And I'm a huge fan of native grasses. I really love them a lot. And I think they're really important in plantings. Um, they grow in virtually all ecosystems, like not this particular species, but grasses in general, from forests to wetlands, beaches, meadows, wet meadows, rocky hilltops, all of it. And if you're interested in planting with native species, I really encourage you to embrace some of the native grasses and try them out. And many of them are distinctive and bunched and very aesthetic. So we do a lot of our growing of grasses, um, or I guess I should say all of our grass growing from seed. And you can see in this photo with Romor's fescue integrated with other wildflowers, what a beautiful and aesthetic grass it is and planted in a swath lake. You can have plantings that look um, more, more ornamental and fashion and tidier, if that is of concern to folks that might be a little hesitant to plant with grasses, that planting them in a cluster can help keep them looking a, a little more um, tidy if that's an aesthetic that appeals to you. So here's the wonderful woolly sunflower with those dark, rich seeds that birds will come to those closed seed heads and pick open through fall. And I really love the way after, I love the flowers and I also love after flowering, the way those seed heads look and the resources they provide over a longer period of time. And the cheerful flowers, you'll find butterflies on them and bees and other kinds of insects that um, are attracted to the cluster of um, flowers that each of these heads has. Large leaf lupins are um, a plant that is not only gorgeous, the foliage is gorgeous and the flowers and large flying bumblebees can get into those flowers like this Bombus vosnesenski I here um, with the huge bundle of pollen right there. But they also teach us something um, that's supposed to not say hybridization, it's supposed to say hybridization, but um, these are a rare species here, but they also readily form hybrids with other lupins. So in garden design with native plants, that is something to consider are species that are susceptible to being crossed with garden plants. And often the native plant will lose out. So in um, saying that kind of in a simpler way, it's like if you plant one of these rare lupins and then you put a different kind of lupin, pollinators will transfer pollen and the next generation will start to convert its genetics to the, the what the non-native one is like. And and it's a way of contaminating genetics and populations. And it's a concern, especially for rare species. So I encourage thoughtful consideration, even if you're interested in having a garden that has native plants and non-native, certainly there's lots of non-native plants that can be planted alongside native plants and having mixed gardens is perfectly fine and, and probably the most realistic scenario for almost everybody. But to, I encourage you not to plant other kinds of um, lupins, especially if you're gonna have a, a 
native lupin species like this. So lupins are in um, in terms of growing native plants, if that's something that interests you, they're a species that has a really tough seed coat. A lot of the pea family plants do, and these are plant family Fabaceae or the pea family, and they require um, a, a scarification to, you have to physically damage the seed to break dormancy to encourage germination, or I shouldn't say you have to, it can help encourage germination. So sometimes we do that by putting seeds in a jar that's lined with sandpaper and shaking it. Um, sometimes a hot water bath will do that, believe it or not. So you can boil water and, and pour it over seeds and that can help trigger that germination. And sometimes it's just patience. Species like this, and there's some other species where you need to wait a couple years. And I think that with garden design in general and working with native plants, working with any plant, <laughs> It's important to be patient and to allow the time that things need to, to take shape. And with lupins, that's a good example. Like sometimes if I sow lupins or another species that might take a longer time to germinate, I'm happy to wait. And here's a patch of the large leaf lupin with woolly sunflower. And there's lots of other things in this meadow space, but you can see the bee flying to the lupin and, and what a beautiful plant it is. So nodding onion or allium cernuum, this is um, a big swath of it with woolly sunflower behind it. And it's another species that um, it requires cold stratification. So when I'm talking about cold stratification, I'm talking about plants where the seeds have to go through a winter in order for them to sprout. So there are seeds or plants that you would sow in the fall and then they would sprout in the spring. Um, and that's what you're seeing in this lower picture, little trays of um, nodding onion. And then if you're in your garden design, you're interested in edible plant species, this is a wonderful one to start with. It's not only extremely beautiful and has a lot of ecological and pollinator value, but it has a really accessible culinary use. And it's all parts of the plant from the bulb through the leaves and also the flowers. So this plant will be recognizable to lots of people and Marika and the EYA team have grown lots of this plant. Um, so this one is yarrow. There's a Lorquin's Admiral. Your yarrow, you're sure to find an incredible array of insect life on it, including um, butterflies. And the beautiful distinctive foliage is a way to identify it. And then it has these umbels of lovely small white flowers and it's in the um, aster plant family. And it's one that you would mostly grow in a, a full sun garden spot. And it's quite tall and it's on the more vigorous side. And in garden design, in a larger space, vigorous species can be wonderful to occupy lots of space and planting more vigorous species with other species that are vigorous. If you plant a really vigorous plant in a really small garden space or a space you don't want to fill up, that can be problematic. So that's some of the considerations in garden design are putting assemblages of plants together that can compete effectively with each other or don't dominate one another. And that's something that takes time to hone, to understand what the plants are like. And that's just a patience thing and a trial and error and doing a little bit of research ahead. But the general concept of planting vigorous plants with other vigorous plants and gentler plants with other gentle plants is something to consider. And it's a plant like many vigorous species that grows through underground stems called rhizomes. And this is a pattern of growth you're probably familiar with, even if you don't know the name for it, but where the plant grows below ground and keeps popping up and that's called rhizomatous, and yarrow is an example of that. And it's a growth pattern to think about um, 
or to consider as being one that's quite common with the more vigorous plants. And growing plants in general, this is how this like garden design and propagating and growing plants has um, so much entwined with each other because you really do need to have some kind of understanding of how, what the plant's growth form is like to inform how to plant it and how, what expectations to have for it in a garden space. So growing them is a great way to learn about that. And here's an area showing you some of the plants we've been talking about all together. So this is at Neath Twa Child and Family Services Building in Sayout Territory on the uh, Saanich Peninsula. And uh, we work with Neath Twa on uh, garden spaces through, throughout the land. And this beautiful meadow patch is just sitting in the middle of a parking area showing what can be done with urban spaces. And there's the plants we've been talking about. There's a Romer's fescue, nodding onion here, woolly sunflower, and, and yarrow all together. So the last two plants are, we're going to just talk about some of the shadier plants. So we've been talking quite a bit about more sun-loving plants. And these last two that EYA has been growing um, are shade-loving, although Aquilegia red columbine can grow in sun. But typically I grow it in part shade, I would say, and even like even shade, but you can put it in a sunny spot, especially in the Vancouver area where you have more winter rain and just some more precipitation than we do on southern Vancouver Island where I'm calling in from. We have about half the rain that um, Vancouver does. So we're limited. We have well, we have different plants and we have some overlapping, but some different. So it's a lovely plant. Um, you wouldn't know it necessarily from looking at it, but it's actually in the buttercup plant family, Ranunculaceae, and has these wonderful reflexed flowers with the spurs. And you can see this bumblebee, it's not pollinating the plant. It's not going through where all the anthers are sticking out. It's cheating and it's going right to the nectar gland and going straight to the source instead of pollinating the flower. And you see this behavior uh, quite regularly, not just, not just in humans, you see it in animals, other animals too. So here's um, a planting of red columbine with another hummingbird plant. Um, this is hedge nettle. And in the backdrop, you have a mock orange. And this is an example of a place where you don't need a hummingbird feeder <laughs> in this setting, although technically we actually have one really close to here, <laughs> but you would see hummingbirds nonetheless going to all the different flowers here. And one of the aspects with garden design that comes through getting to know plants will be um, overlapping blooming times of different species that you wanna see flower next to each other at the same time. So this is a wonderful example of that where we know that the columbine and the hedge nettle and the mock orange is gonna be out all at the same time and be this wonderful buffet um, that the hummingbirds and other animals can enjoy and, almost, and also super visually pleasing. So the last um, profile plant before we move on is bleeding heart, Dicentra formosa. And it forms these pods, um, these, and this is their fruit, the pods, and they have little black seeds. And interestingly, they attach to the seed as a little fatty body called an eliasome, and ants are attracted to them. And that's how the seeds are distributed is through ants. And they drag them below ground, but the ants aren't interested in the seeds. They're interested in the fatty body that's attached to the seeds, but it's, uh, a co-evolutionary process where that's how um, bleeding heart can be brought into the soil profile and go on to form patches. The bleeding heart is also rhizomatous. And you, you see this quite often with plants. They don't necessarily just have one means of growing. They can have multiple means of propagating. And it's kind of like not putting all your eggs in one basket. You, you can have seeds. You can also grow veget propagate vegetatively and make sure that um, you can go on to thrive. 
So here's another photo from Neath Twa, and you can see this combination where you have red flowering current with a beautiful understory of some, there's miners lettuce here, and then this whole swath of bleeding heart forming a lovely carpet um, with the structural red columbines, also part of the garden space. And it's really nice because the columbine and the bleeding heart will bloom at the same time and you can have um, lovely pink flowers from both at the same time. So in thinking about uh, designing gardens that are pollinator friendly, there's some basic themes I wanted to comment on. One is considering the coevolution between pollinators and plants over millennia, um, which has resulted in that planting at least with some native plants is really important because these are the plants that pollinators have co-evolved with. And to really have the abundance and species diversity and support that diversity at least some native plants have to be um, included in garden spaces that are truly pollinator friendly. Um, producing pollen and nectar throughout the growing season. So that has to do with plant succession and I'll touch on that more deeply in a moment. Gardens that are pollinator friendly also make considerations for the animals um, beyond just their flying stages. So uh, here's, a swallowtail butterfly that um, is on a cow parsnip and that's where the adult laid the egg and then this will pupate and then turn into a, a butterfly but it ne also needs this stage to um, thrive. Avoiding pesticide treated plants Super importantly, maintaining existing nat natural areas and supporting natural areas, not just relying on planting gardens, but they're part of the, the recipe to ecological health. Um, and I, I suppose I've already said consider all the life phases. So diversity and composition. So I'm just talking about different shapes of flowers. So remember the lupins with the bombus there coming into the flower, but here's a mountain sneezeweed and a camas with a super exposed landing pad for pollinators. And then to the left, the broadleaf shooting star that requires um, bumblebees to release the pollen from those flowers. And all these, the way you can think of it, kind of like diversity, attracting diversity, and intuitively it makes sense. You'll get more different things if you have more different things. And pollinators and plants um, are similar to that. And bees have different shaped bodies, different sizes and uh, different tongue lengths to access pollen. And uh, you, might, you might already know this or might not know this, but in, uh, in BC, there's over 450 different species of native bees. So when we're talking about supporting diversity, we're talking about a lot <laughs> of diversity. Diversity in structure. So approaching diversity in a multitude of ways. And when you do this, you're, you're also incorporating the different life phases of, of animals. So some of the examples I'm trying to highlight here are in this center photo with this long stolen sedge, there's bare soil between the plants. And your first reaction in the garden setting might be to like mulch that all over or can't have any bare soil. But a lot of our nesting bees are ground nesting solitary bees that if you mulch over their nest sites, won't, won't be able to have that habitat and that good habitat quality that's needed. And so sometimes even compacted or sandy soils in a garden setting can be beneficial for bees. And to take your time observing spaces in your garden to see if you think anything is occupying those spaces. And um, here are the stalks of duckweed or Lomatium nudicoli, bare stem desert parsley. Hollow stem plants are, often nesting sites for bees. 
So you might think, oh, I better clean up my garden, get rid of everything and burn all of the thatch and all, all those things. But sometimes it's good to leave things standing because there's things that are occupying those spaces and hollow stems are a good example of that. And understandably, especially in if you're um, in a public garden space or high profile space, or maybe it's your home or apartment and you 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 want to keep things tidy. I do understand that sometimes that's needed and not to think that you have to keep everything super messy to support wildlife. I think um, it's better to have some native plants and clean them up to just avoid it completely because you will have, um, cer certainly you'll have lots of benefits for wildlife. So here's an example of uh, succession. So when I say succession, I'm just talking about having this flow of blooming time so that um, different animals coming out at different times of the season have resources available in, a, in your single garden space. And well-designed pollinator wildlife friendly gardens often will have some aspects of succession in mind. And the plant suite here is just an example of that. There's so many different examples. These are just um, some of the examples, but starting this, and these aren't transferable to all eco regions or anything like that. But for Southern Vancouver Island, if I'm thinking about what I want to be blooming in February, going all the way to October, this would be a reasonable succession. And it doesn't necessarily mean I would even put all of these things all together. But maybe in a garden space, I have the vigorous things together. And maybe in a different spot, I have things that love sun and shallow soil. And in a different spot, I have ones that like mucky soil in the shade. And that habitat overall, the context of the entire habitat is working well together and providing resources. So with garden design, thinking about Soils, watering, and placement, as well as density, are important aspects. I like to approach soil when it's like not not speaking towards contaminated soils. That would be like a different story, of course. But this differentiation of people saying, you know, like good soil or bad soil. I think sometimes what's being classified are bad soils are actually just soils that have clay and clay soils are normal for here. They're part of our like, um, and for specifically Southern Vancouver Island and, and other places too, but with glacial history, they're the story of the past. They're from a time where seawater was flooded over land and deposits were filtering through ocean water and settled. And then the, there was rebound of the earth's crust and the recession of the glaciers and we're left with clay soils and the suite of plants that um, many of these clay soil habitats have are totally adapted to the clay soils. And so in short, I encourage you to look at your soils and, and Sometimes instead of modifying soils to work for plants, choose plants that might work for those soils and you might have less of an uphill battle. And that's not all always the case. It's just a consideration to make an interpretation of soils. Um, there are lots of cases where in soil or site preparation, we bring in soil because of um, weed issues. And so bringing in clean, like clean or weed-free soil is sometimes part of our restoration recipe ahead of seeding or planting. And so each site will have something different. And that's the case with all garden design and all restoration is you really have to evaluate each site independently and think about the goals and think about what needs to happen to bring those goals to life. In terms of watering, um, I really like to kind of, there isn't just one single watering uh, recipe. So 
if you want to create a drought tolerant garden, not all native plants are just inherently drought tolerant if they're not planted appropriately. So that's something to consider that if you are trying to do a drought tolerant garden, one of the main points of consideration is, am I choosing a suite of plants that's suited to this habitat type? And if it's suited to the habitat type, it will be drought tolerant. It, you know, native plants in a region are more or less surviving with the natural rainfall regime. And you should expect that in a garden that is receiving that same rainfall and planted with a suite of species that's adapted to that kind of soil. Um, but if you try to put, let's say, wetland plants in a dry soil, they're not necessarily going to be drought adapted. But sometimes you can push the boundaries in garden settings and give plants supplemental watering for specific objectives. And so there's nothing wrong with that. You can think about that and think about how you strategize and what the reason for that might be. And if you are interested in not watering, choosing kind of um, drought tolerant meadow type species or species that are tolerant of uh, drought or drainage and planting them in fall when they can establish roots before it's hot and sunny. So if you take, you know, if you take a, a super drought tolerant plant and then plant it in the middle of summer, it can still die if it didn't have time to establish properly before um, you, you just, uh, you know, before it's hot and they don't have roots. So thinking about that, where if you plant and fall, let the roots establish, it can encourage drought tolerance through a different part of the growing season. And then placement and density, some of this, like if you're doing more of like a, a restoration, let's say, where you're trying to mimic an environment type, you might be planting at a super high density and seeding at a really high density to try to get lots of competitive interactions and all the components of the flora in place. But you might, uh, on, in contrast, have a planting that you want to do that follows like something that speaks to you in a different way or a placement that works for you for other reasons. And there's no right or wrong with if you're like it, have a planter or you're in the ground um, in a backyard or community garden or whatever it is. There's so much variation in planting density and also sometimes things that will just set seed and and propagate over time or fill in over time. So there's reasons for doing different things related to placement and density. If you're in a space, for example, that is maybe susceptible to getting really weedy, you might want super quick establishment. So you plant a high density with lots of seeds or you want, um, you know, so, but I think you understand what I mean. There can be different reasons for placement and, and density and to not be too hard on yourself. Don't let that kind of stuff make you not want to garden with native plants because you're worried you'll get it wrong. There's uh, a million ways to make a wrong or right. So with approach, what I'm getting at there is whether you're going to use pots or seeds and some of the reasons you might in the top right there, there's plugs. If you had a big huge space to plant and you're like, holy smokes, I can't afford to do this. You might think about approaching it with plugs and seeds. Then if you were like planting, you know, just five shrubs and they're right in your front yard and you wanted some privacy, you might plant some really big shrubs and give them water so that they grow super fast and get established. So there's lots of ways to approach planting, but making these considerations and doing some garden planning before you start can be helpful. And it always starts with like what your goals are. So if your goal isn't quick establishment, you might take a different route than if it's I want um, faster establishment or faster coverage. There's always troubleshooting with gardens. Some of that can be, holy smokes, I sowed my seed and I have no idea what's coming up. Or it can be, um, I planted a bunch of bulbs and they're not going to show up for six months. And how do I prevent them from all being trampled? 
And there's all different ways to approach those things. So on the left, I'm showing uh, a planting party where we've planted bulbs. And during the planting, we've covered them up to avoid trampling them as we move around. So that would be kind of an approach. You wouldn't keep this like this over a long period of time. I'm just talking about during the planting party, but different approaches like that. And also here, this insect netting is protecting these new little seedlings from birds coming and picking the seeds up. So troubleshooting issues, some of that might look like birds or slugs, or maybe it's too much sunlight. So you need some shade cloth or something like that. But there's all sorts of ways to, um, to uh, troubleshoot issues you might be having in a garden setting. So the last part here, so we're at eight and I wanna make sure we give lots of time for questions. So we'll just be about 10 minutes here and then we'll have plenty of time for questions. And I know I'm babbling a lot, so thanks so much for your patience. Um, but there really are native plants for all occasions. And I hear a lot of like garden cultivar mythologies and mythologies about native plants. Like, oh, we have to, we have to plant this non-native thing because there isn't a native plant for that scenario or native plants are inherently messy or, and all of these things are just mythologies. So with, um, native, they're not being a native plant for a different, some kind of occasion just doesn't exist. <laughs> like if you're in an env environment, there is a native plant for all occasions, uh, even in extremely disturbed sites, there are alternatives for revegetation that include native plant species. And in terms of um, mythologies around native plants being messy, native plants aren't like inherently more messy or anything like that. I think it's that there's a tendency for when native plants are being plant planted for wildlife to be top of mind and that people aren't imposing so much of the things that make plants look tidy on them. Some of those things are just like mulching and pruning and cutting back and edging and those things. And you can do all those things with native plants if it's something that helps make native plants more approachable for you. And that's completely uh, respectable. Um, in terms of native plants for all occasions, here's an overhang of a house, super dry. This is a scenario that many people run into with buildings, but there are plants that can, can work in environments like this. In this case, we've been able to plant uh, fringe cup and foam flower and woodland strawberries and Siberian miners lettuce under this overhang. And it's creating a beautiful green buffer against this sidewalk that is aesthetically pleasing and, and um, also has wildlife benefits. Um, container gardening can be such a wonderful and fun thing to do. Um, apologies for the blurry picture there. I'm not sure what happened there, but Amy Peltier, who's one of our meadow makers and also works with Parks Canada doing tremendous restoration work. She's created these community garden spaces outside of her home and has even encouraged other neighbors to create similar plantings along the street here. And this is in one of the Victoria neighborhoods. And she has some of her plants and planters and some in these small patches that are edged up within the sidewalk. And if you go down that street now, everyone knows who Amy is and she's done a lot of neighborhood outreach and has other people doing similar things. And planters, for a lot of people, if you're like moving or you're in a, um, in a situation where it's just not feasible to have a larger planting or you need things to be able to move, et cetera, that planters can be uh, a wonderful thing to, to consider. So I'm gonna just go through some of these images of settings where you can imagine native plants and gardens. These are um, clusters that of plantings and you could easily plant things like this and within a year have blossoms and colors like this. These are samples where we have planted with more density for quick coverage, um, but you'll get an idea. These pictures have uh, 
the top two with the pink flowers are both annual species. So they're plants that we've done from seed. And then the others are perennials where we've planted them from pot. And then the lower right photo is a newish garden that we've done with fawn lilies and um, shooting stars and long stolen sedge and some other things in there too. There's camas in there and some other grasses and, and uh, native Western bus buttercup. Boulevards. So these can be opportunities where you might not have a lawn, but you could reach out about utilizing boulevard space. And a lot of municipalities, districts, and cities are becoming much more lenient with boulevard plantings, particularly with native species. And in a garden design involving boulevards, you might think about species that are low to mid height instead of um, really tall. And it doesn't mean that you can't plant tall things in boulevards. People do it with non-native plants all the time with trees and things. But their idea is if you um, are running into guidelines that restrict height or size or, or taking uh, visibility lines into account. And I would overall encourage, like just generally encourage people to um, try to follow the guidelines and gain um, a little bit of sort of like build that relationship with your municipality and then try to kind of stretch the boundaries. I think kind of like a non-combative approach can be really beneficial in these kind of scenarios where we're trying to bend rules and try to encourage more in a, you know, sometimes bureaucratic agencies and things like that to like take a different stance. I think that sometimes um, a boulevards kind of fall into that category. And I think there's lots of opportunities utilizing species that won't alarm them. <laughs> um, here are some samples of other meadow and cluster plantings using native plants. So I love these big swath plantings and a lot of uh, local native species. This Henderson's checker mallow, you'll see this in estuary plantings in the lower mainland. Um, Fool's onion here. Here's that nodding onion and woolly sunflower again. So trying to show imagery of, of species that EYA is, is growing and distributing now as well. There are lots of opportunities for a huge variety of habitat types. These are wetland, pond, and rain garden examples that we've planted. And these spaces were totally devoid of all vegetation and, and you can easily incorporate um, native plants into to sites like this and create really beautiful, diverse uh, spaces. And sometimes places with water that didn't have water before and putting wetland plants into them and seeing them thrive and seeing associated wildlife with these wetter habitats thriving too. Uh, in a garden design, something to think about, if you have enough space and inclination, one of the ways to incorporate even later blooming species is to have a spot that is wet. Um, if you kind of relate that back to local ecologies, uh, a wetter soil can will be flooded in the winter and will bloom later because the soil, soil is saturated for longer. So as that becomes uh, drier through the spring and summer, that's when you see the blooming. And drier habitats tend to um, bloom earlier. And the last slide, or actually almost the last slide, I just wanted to make a couple comments about um, a general ap approach to gardening with native plants and garden design that I think it's important to include patience and respect, awareness, and acceptance. And this includes not trying to uh, always impose our demands, even in a garden setting where we're so used to kind of curating a garden as if the plants are pieces of furniture that we just place and they'll just sit there and do what we've told them and not change. And it's an inherently flawed view, particularly when working with native plants, that it to embrace how they change, what their true nature is like, and to honor that through being patient and respecting local ecology, local indigenous land management and stewardship 
over millennia and all of the wildlife that depends on native plants. And even aesthetically to shift what your perspectives are of beauty. So um, too often I find that we're looking at plants and expect them to just flower all the time. And it's not necessarily like that. And that there's a beauty in the seed heads and the old bracts of plants and the stems and the brown colors and those things. And um, plants in general will have a cyclical nature, will not be flowering all the time, will not just sit in the same spot as if they're uh, dead. <laughs> and um, this can be one of the beauties of gardening with native plants and in designing gardens and accepting the changes and, and growing along with your garden. So um, thank you so much for listening to all of this. And it's been such a pleasure talking with everybody. If you get a chance, I'd love if you could check out our website. Um, there's a whole bunch of different things to look at on there. Um, we have a program that Marika mentioned called Meadow Makers. It's a, a quite a long program. It It's about four months. Um, we're in our second year of doing it. So this, the 2023 session is full. But if it's something that might interest you or you're interested in learning more about creating meadow spaces and meadow restoration, it might be something that interests you. And we, we open registration for this in the winter. And then in the spring, we have the longer program that includes in-person sessions, field trips, and virtual talks. And a shout out to the beautiful and wonderful Sarah Jim. Um, Sarah Jim Art Studio is her website. And she is a Wasanich artist from Sacum who um, does exceptional artwork and who created the Meadow Makers logo for us. So happy growing and planting. And thank you so much for your time. And we have about 15 minutes for questions. And David, thank you so much for being such a terrific host <laughs> and helping us field questions and things. And I'll just leave it at that, but thank you. Um, yeah, thank you so much, Kristen. Uh, that was very really inspiring and I learned a lot. Um, do you, you could just stop sharing your screen. We'll go back to the. Oh yeah, thank you. We'll go back to the main screen. Um, so we had a few questions coming up throughout the presentation. I'm just going to do a quick scan. And see what I can find. Um, so one question from. Um, Cromilda was about um, the lupins and like how far is a safe distance for lupins to not cross pollinate? I don't know. Marika might actually be better to answer that. So I think bumblebees being larger bodied tend to fly further than some bees, but I think generally are limited to a couple hundred meters. Marika, would you mind piping in there to help me out with that? To my recollection, like bumblebees can fly like some, I think it's up to 10 kilometers. Oh gosh, um, okay. Species? Oh no, maybe it's <laughs> one kilometer. Sorry, don't quote me on that. It's been a few years since I've read that book, um, A Sting in the Tail, but uh, uh, the smaller bees, um, do you generally stay closer to home, like more like 200 meters? Um, but yeah, bumblebees and I know honeybees as well can fly at least a kilometer, um, probably more. <laughs> so yeah, that, yeah. So I don't know if that helps. <laughs> oh, it does, it does help. Well, it inspire, like, and also will inspire us to, figure this out. <laughs> I'll quickly Google it and I'll type it in the chat so how far a bumblebee can fly. Okay. Uh, Jade was asking, can you propagate rather than 
do grow lupins from seed? I assume that means propagate from a cutting rather than propagating from a seed? Yeah, I don't... Well, yes, because there's... So there's a variety of different lupins. So there's some lupins are annual where we those we just do from seed. Then lupinus polyphyllus is a perennial lupin that is rhizomatous and you can form patches that aren't just from seed and make divisions of plants that way with that particular species. Okay. Um, and another question, which is the question that I get asked is, are any of these to toxic to dogs? <laughs> um, and I, I have Googled this question before and the general consensus is there's not enough research to know. Um, but I yeah, I think that there, like, I'm not sure which species would be most toxic to dogs. Like, there's some that I think are totally benign that we talked about tonight. Like, some that are, like, the palatable species to humans, like the yarrow and nodding onion. Plants in the ranunculaceae family, like, the... Apollegia might be something where if your dog mowed it down, but a lot of animals won't eat things that are toxic. That isn't like all the time, but like an example is like daffodils, like daffodils are toxic, but like no one cares if their dogs are running around daffodils. So I think it's like, yeah, I don't think we talked about anything that I would be like alarmed about. I wouldn't mind I, yeah, I don't know. Okay. <laughs> so I guess short is I don't know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, question from Jay: Do you have any ideas to green green and support water retention below cedar, hemlock, and birch trees on a steep slope? So the question was: Sorry, it was about water retention yeah. on a steep slope around. Green around cedar and hemlock to retain the water and green the area below cedar. Yeah, growing below cedar can be, like cedar patches, I'm hearing some echoing for some reason. Are you guys hearing that? Yeah, uh, can everyone make sure their mic is muted? Yeah, thank you. been me, sorry. <laughs> no, no problem, Rika. I could just hear echoing. I wasn't sure where it was coming from. Um, sometimes under cedar, they have a shallow root system and they also have placatic acid that can inhibit growth of other vegetation below them. And you probably notice that if you're hiking through a cedar grove, it's not always like super lush below cedar. So there are sometimes patches of trees with this combination of shade, mulching needles and other factors. Sometimes it's shallow roots or other reasons why it's difficult to establish vegetation. But if you were gonna try plants below there, plants like, um, and if you're on the mainland, um, plants like sword fern and salal and woodland strawberry could be plants that you could try and see how they do. Fringe cup is also one that we looked at tonight that is sometimes quite easy going about getting established and is pro uh, prolific seed setter so it's one that you can get nice patches of but maybe try with a little bit of trial and error but if you find that plants aren't establishing it doesn't necessarily mean something's wrong it can be a variety of factors combined that make it just not as hospitable of an environment for the plants but if the habitat also includes hemlock I would think that there was um the potential to grow some of those other kinds of woodland species that are tolerant of uh, shade. Okay, thank you. That's a great answer because I was I have the same problem in my front yard. Um, so that's good to know. Um, what plants would you recommend for a sunny area to create a native food forest? Ooh, there's lots of beautiful plants that could be included in that way. So if you were looking for plants that 
or shrubs or trees that had berries on the mainland. You might think of things like evergreen huckleberries with beautiful dark blue berries and evergreen foliage, and they fruit quite late. Um, red huckleberries are wonderful, but a little bit trickier because they often are growing out of decaying wood and stumps. So you might, if you had some decaying wood, try one in a space like that. There's plants that EYA is working with, like red elderberry. That's uh, a wonderful uh, shrub that produces berries, though you can't eat them raw. You have to be careful about eating them raw. And then there's a lot of like mid to low growing plants that have um, favorable fruit, like strawberries. So there's a few different strawberry species, but just in general, like wild strawberries or woodland strawberries could be something to, to think about. And then um, coastal mugwort is a really aromatic shrub. It's not a berry producing shrub, but something to think about. But there's so many opportunities for palatability. palatability. Some of the resources I would encourage to look at are community-based resources. Um, there's plant and knowledge cards through Strong Nations Publishing, and Strong Nations Publishing has other um, information as well, or other, sorry, other books. Um, Sanich Ethnobotany is a great resource, and Plants of Coastal BC, uh, written in partnership with knowledge from uh, a variety of elders and synthesized by Nancy Turner into that into sections of that book. But uh, yeah, lots of opportunities for learning and reading and connecting with community and also like Environmental Youth Alliance is like a great, is an excellent way to start for some of that. Um, there's a question from Matthew, um, which is presumably referring to Yarrow being quite an, uh, aggressive spreader. Um, uh, and they're asking, why wouldn't you want to isolate that plant um, so it doesn't take over? Why wouldn't you or why would you? Why wouldn't you want to isolate the plant so it doesn't take over? Yeah. Yeah, so if you, um, I think it's like in that part of the talk where I was talking about placement of plants and planting other vigorous plants with vigorous plants yeah. to prevent that. So. With yarrow um, in a small garden space, it can outcompete, uh, especially if you planted it with plants that die back after blooming. So camas is an example of that. So if you have a low competitive environment and put yarrow and camas together in a really small space, and the camas grows year round, but the cam or the yarrow grows year round, but not the camas, sometimes you'll like lose the canis or the shooting star or whatever that's died back below ground. Um, so instead you could think about a planting cluster that say had yarrow, goldenrod, mountain sneezeweed, fireweed, and lupins, and they'll happily grow all together and not outcompete each other because their pattern of growth is similar and so are their phenologies. But um, it doesn't mean like with yarrow because sometimes yarrow gets like a little bit of a bad rap for being vigorous, but it grows in a whole range of environments, including habitats that include more fragile species. But in a garden setting, things are out of whack. They haven't um, progressed in a natural way and kind of come in at different times together. So there are lots of meadow plantings we do where we do include yarrow at some point. Uh, sometimes if you get plants established first and then include yarrow, it will grow shorter and, and less vigorously when it has competition. So you do, you see yarrow in beaches, shallow soil meadow sites. Um, so it really is a, um, an important species across a range of habitats. Um, there's a question about um, good native plants uh, for pollinators that grow in the shade. Yes, absolutely. So 
Um, some of the plants that we talked about tonight were hedge nettles. So it had those fuchsia tubular shaped flowers and it likes quite a deep shade. Fringe cup. So fringe cup has these beautiful white fringed flowers that turn pink and they're on a tall stalk. They're in the saxif uh, saxifrage plant family. So they have this basil rosette of leaves and a tall stalk. And you'll see bumblebees coming into the shade. Uh, red columbine is one. Uh, black twinberry, salmonberry. One of the trends you see in a, a pollinator-friendly shade garden is it's the larger body bees that can tolerate the cooler temperatures in the shade. So um, there's a reason pollinators are often affiliated with sun, including our local butterflies. So you don't see butterflies in shade and smaller bodied bees, but you can get bumblebees and hummingbirds going to shade gardens. Okay. Uh, Maurice had a question about um, shrubs like red flowering currant and twinberries. Um, can you take cuttings in the fall or is spring generally better for taking cuttings? And how long does it take for cuttings to take the cuttings to establish hardy roots? Yeah, so my you can take the cuttings both times, but my favorite time is early winter. I like doing kind of November, December. So the leaves have dropped. And I once the I will do them across a range of times, even when the buds are swollen, but when the buds start to break, I stop. Because what I don't want to do is take a cutting and have leaves that are transpiring and the stem tissue is losing moisture. And then with cuttings, you want to cut, or this is the way I do it. So there's, who knows? I also lose a whole bunch of cuttings, but I cut on the, you know how there's buds along a stem and depending on the growth of the plant, that internode, so the space between the nodes can be sh like small or long, depending on how fast the plant grows. I cut below bottom bud, so the bud's atop, uh, on top, then at least one bud has to go below soil because that's where you're going to get the roots growing out of. So one bud has to go below soil. And then my top cut, usually the stem is about six inches long and I do the cut above the top bud. And sometimes a six inch stem cutting, if it's like something like red hot, elderberry you'll have like two nodes you'll have like one below and one above and the whole stalk is just stem but then if it's something like um snowberry you might have a ton of nodes and have rooting multiple sites like below soil and like snowberry is a good example of one that's super easy to take cuttings and you could you can take cuttings quite late with snowberry so it does depend on the species, but my favorite time is like that is winter. I guess I'm wondering, like with our restricted growing timelines of October to June, if cuttings, if we have enough time to grow cuttings in that window, if we cut them in winter, would they establish roots by the end of May or is that way too fast? I think your best bet would be maybe snowberry. Okay. Which you have a good population of. We do. Like, we could do. try it. <laughs> but I'll keep my eye on the snowberry cuttings we did and I'll make an assessment of where I think we're at it in May. Okay. Kristen, I just had another question here. I'll just ask it because I, I wrote it after my first one. What's the composition of the soil that you bring in for restoration projects in weedy areas? Yeah, it depends a little bit, but the the typical blend we do is a custom blend that Peninsula Landscape Supplies does for us. So they're uh, in Sydney on the island. And th the base of the blend is a hyper degraded, degraded bark mulch. And you wouldn't know it was bark mulch. You'd be like, this is topsoil because it's that it's so degraded. Um, and it has compost in it and then a pretty high rate of sand. So it's like, I 
think the ratio is like about 20%, but you can't really go higher than that. Else soil gets like way too heavy. Um, and that's the body of the blend. And that would be like something we would, if we had to bring on to a restoration site, if there was like a reason for it. And then our potting soil is different. Then we have other additions like perlite to aid drainage. And sometimes we add other stuff to it too, like vermiculite or something. It just like depends what it is. So 80% uh, degraded bark mulch and 20% sand. Yeah. For the yes, yeah, so there's compost in there. So it's more yeah. like um I'm really bad at math. For like 40, 40, 20. <laughs> 40, 40, 20. Cool. <laughs> Thanks, Kristen. Um, okay, well, it's 8.30, and unfortunately, there's not enough time to answer all of these questions. Well, people can definitely reach out. They're more than welcome to do that. And if people want to visit us, am I allowed to, like, plug something for just one sec, shamelessly plug, that we have a plant sale this week until Saturday at 4, so it runs all through the week. So if you are on the island or want to come, that would be awesome to see you. And we're open nine to four, Tuesdays to Saturdays. Um, and our current location is Halliburton Farm, just across from Elk Beaver Lake. And feel free to email us. Um, I'm just typing in the address. And check out our website. We have like an online garden cart too. But if you do want the plant sale, you got to come in person. That's our trick. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, I dropped your uh, website in the chat there, and you have your email address. I'm also going to add the email, uh, the website for our native plant fundraiser, which is currently live until the end of April, um, where you can purchase a bundle of native plants, including many of the plants that Kristen has talked about this evening. And feel free, I just want to put it out there that you can email me or David or Marika um, if there are things you wish you would have heard about tonight but didn't or were expecting to hear, within reason. <laughs> you can definitely let us know because we like always adapt content to um, what we're hearing back from people and like what you enjoyed the most and things like that. It's like really helpful and helps guide expectations about talks and things. So feel free to let us know. David, do you like how I just told everyone to email you that? Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> well, I love those kind of emails anyway, so. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Marika, sharing our email address. Um, please do reach out, we're happy to answer questions. Um, and with that, um, thank you so much, Kristen, for joining us and that for that really inspiring and informative presentation. Thank you so much. And it was just, uh, I really appreciate the hospitality and the beautiful introduction, Rika, and just such a welcoming group and um, what an honor it is to be able to share my passion with people and feel it reciprocated and it's just so uh just a lovely rewarding thing and i really appreciate everyone's time thank you do you have any um thing final things to say marika um uh, i just want to say hi i know there's a lot of people in the audience that i recognize from our community and just other um adventures in life so it, it's it was just really great to see you all here and and also of course to to welcome Kristen and and learn alongside you all so thank you so much everyone it was an awesome night okay bye bye